Hi, good day. Welcome back to our class in chemistry. Today, I will be discussing about organic chemistry. Now, let's have a brief history of the organic chemistry. In the 18th century, it was believed that a vital force was needed in order to form the compounds found in the living cells which are the organic compounds. However, this belief was overthrown by Friedrich Wuller, who made an experiment in 1828 when he produced urea, which is commonly found in the blood and in the urine, when he heated an ammonium cyanate, which is an inorganic compound. After Wuller's work, he was able to form other organic compounds and this led to the subdivision of chemistry which are now inorganic and organic chemistry. What is the importance of organic chemistry? By the way, organic chemistry deals with the topics which are important to our lives. It is the chemistry of the living organisms which talks about the plants and the animals. The topics that we're going to discuss in here involves the hydrocarbons, the alcohols, the phenols and the thiols, the ethers, the aldehydes and ketones, the carboxylic acids, and the esters. Now in organic chemistry, we will be talking about compounds which contains carbon atoms. In fact, organic chemistry is known as the chemistry of carbon compounds. To start with, let us differentiate organic compounds from inorganic compounds. The properties that we are going to compare are the following. The flammability, the melting point, the boiling point, the solubility in water, the property of the solubility in polar compounds, the type of bonding, reaction exhibited by these compounds, the atoms per molecule, the structure, and its property being an electrolyte. So, let's start with the property on flammability. Organic compounds are very flammable, while inorganic compounds are less flammable. For example, when you are going to enkindle the paper, it burns immediately. However, if you are going to burn the magnesium ribbon, it takes time to burn. That means the kindling temperature of organic compounds is low, but the kindling temperature of inorganic compounds is high. What do you mean by kindling temperature? By kindling temperature, it means it is the temperature at which a substance starts to burn. The next property to be compared is that of the melting point. Now, the melting point of the organic compounds is low, while the melting point of the inorganic compounds is high. The next property is that of the boiling point. The organic compounds have low boiling point, while the inorganic compounds have high boiling point. For example, the ethyl alcohol, which is organic, because we know ethyl alcohol comes from a plant, like for example, the sugar cane. We can produce ethyl alcohol from sugar cane. The ethyl alcohol has a boiling point of 78 degrees centigrade, while that of water, which is inorganic, boils at 100 degrees centigrade. The next property to be compared is the solubility in water. Now, organic compounds does not dissolve in water, while inorganic compounds dissolve in water. 
For example, the oil, which is organic, does not dissolve in water, while the table salt dissolves in water. The next property to be compared is the solubility towards polar compounds. Now, a good solvent to be considered as polar is the alcohol or the carbon tetrachloride or the ether. Now, organic compounds dissolve in polar solvents, while inorganic compounds does not dissolve in polar solvents. For example, the naphthalene dissolves in kerosene, where kerosene is a polar solvent, while table salt, which is inorganic, does not dissolve in the kerosene. Next property to be compared is the type of bonding. Now, the organic compounds exhibits covalent bonding, while that of the inorganic compounds exhibit ionic bonding. For example, the compound methane. The hydrogen in the structure of methane is covalently bonded to carbon. In a case of inorganic compound, say for example, sodium chloride, the sodium is ionically bonded to chlorine. Another property to be compared is that of the reaction exhibited by these compounds. For organic compounds, the reaction exhibited is by molecule, while that of the inorganic compounds is by ions. That's why, when you observe in the experiment that organic compounds reacted slowly, while that of the ferric sulfate, it was fast. Because ethyl alcohol, again, is organic, while the ferric sulfate is inorganic. Now, another property to be compared is that of the atoms per molecule. Now, in organic compounds, there are many atoms involved in a molecule, while that of the inorganic compounds, it's lesser. For example, in the case of ethyl alcohol, you have a lot of atoms involved. You have the hydrogen, you have the carbon, you have the oxygen. While comparing it with water, you have only hydrogen and oxygen. Another property to be compared is that of the structure. Now, organic compounds have complex structure, while that of the inorganic compounds, they are simple in structure. For example, for the structure isopropyl alcohol. So, this involves already an isostructure. You have a branch structure. While comparing this with sodium chloride, it has only a linear structure. Another property to be compared is that of being an electrolyte. What do you mean by electrolyte? An electrolyte is a substance that conducts electricity when in solution form. Comparing the organic and inorganic compounds, the organic compounds are non-electrolytes, while the inorganic compounds are good electrolytes, meaning the organic compounds does not conduct electricity, while that of inorganic compounds, they conduct electricity. For example, when sugar is in solution form, it is not a good electrolyte, meaning it does not conduct electricity, while that of sodium chloride, when it is in the solution form, it conducts electricity. So those are the comparisons between organic and inorganic compounds. I said a while ago that the organic compounds are composed mainly of carbon, although there are other atoms composing organic compounds such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Carbon being the major component of organic compounds is important to take note. Why? Because carbon can bond 
by itself. Meaning, you can bond carbon to carbon. Why? Because carbon is a tetravalent atom. What do you mean by tetravalent? This means it has the ability to form four other bonds. So with these four other bonds, you can bond carbon with another carbon. You can bond carbon to oxygen. You can bond carbon to hydrogen. You can bond carbon to sulfur. So it has the ability to form four other bonds. Another important thing to take note about carbon is that it has its allotropes. Now, what are these allotropes of carbon? One, we have graphite. Graphite is a soft, dark, black substance which has a good electrical conductivity. This therefore implies that graphite is a good insulator. In fact, graphite is used as one of the component in making the crucible. I think you're familiar with the crucible. That apparatus which is used in containing substances to be heated at high temperatures. The hydrocarbons are of two groups. One group is the aliphatic hydrocarbons, while the other group is the aromatic hydrocarbons. These aliphatic hydrocarbons are those hydrocarbons which are in open chain structure, while the aromatic hydrocarbons are those hydrocarbons in cyclic structure. Now for the aliphatic hydrocarbons, there are also two major groups. One is the saturated hydrocarbon, and the other one is the unsaturated hydrocarbons. For the saturated hydrocarbons, we have the alkanes, while the unsaturated hydrocarbons, we have the alkenes and the alkynes. Now let us characterize the alkanes. For the alkanes, these are saturated hydrocarbons bonded with single bonds. These are otherwise known as the paraffins. The word paraffin comes from the word parum affines or para affines, which means of less affinity. When we say less affinity, it means it is less reactive. The alkanes, by the way, has the general formula CnH2n plus 2. And the name of the alkanes and N A N E. That's why. You have, for example, the methane, which is an alkane. The alkanes with one to four carbon atoms are gaseous in form, while those alkanes with five to 16 carbon atoms are liquid in state. Here is where the gasoline is included. While those alkanes with more than 16 carbon atoms are already solid in form. So here is where the waxes are. On the other hand, let's go to the unsaturated hydrocarbons. For the unsaturated hydrocarbons, we have the alkenes and the alkynes. Let's discuss first the alkenes. The alkene is known as oleum, which means oil forming. This alkene has a general formula, CnH2n. What does that mean? It means that for every number of carbon atom, you have to double that for the number of hydrogen atoms. And the functional group of the alkene is known as the ethene. And it has the structure C double bond C. In fact, this ethene is known as the first member of the alkene family. In naming the alkene, the name ends in E-N-E. -E. Another unsaturated hydrocarbon is the alkyne. Now this alkyne is known as the acetylene. 
the acetylene is a very common compound because this is used for wielding purposes. The alkyne, by the way, is having the structure wherein the carbon atoms are bonded to another carbon atom with triple bonds. In these triple bonds, the two are pi bonds, while the other one is a sigma bond. Try to recall our lesson in bonding. Now, the functional group of the alkynes is the acetylene, that is having a structure C triple bond C. In fact, the first member of the alkyne family is the acetylene. And it has a general formula of CnH2n minus 2. And the name of the alkynes ends in YNE or I. So that would be all for the introduction about organic chemistry. But I will give you an assignment about the naming of the alkanes, the alkanes, and the alkynes. So kindly read some examples of the alkanes, especially on how to name them. Likewise, the alkenes and the alkynes. So that would be all for today. And this is your teacher, Professor Nisita Ruiz of Holy Name University.